Neighbors, I used to live in South Texas, like I said before, but now I live in Southern Indiana. This story's about there, sort of. At quarter past seven on a Saturday morning in late April, Billy Wilkins noses his truck off the Sparksville Road, bumps along what used to be his grandfather's lane till he pulls even with the big sycamore just east of the creek. He parks, gets out, stretches, notes the cedar trees scattered across what used to be a good hay field. Ten acres of fescue between the creek and the woods used to get better than a hundred square bales of good hay off this field, and now look at him. On foot, he follows the lane north till it dips into the woods. At the willow thicket, he turns east and follows the dry branch. He's come here, he thinks, to look for mushrooms, or maybe it was just to get out of Bloomington, out of his father's house, left the old boy with the nurse from the hospice. Susie? No, it was Jennifer. His father likes Jennifer. She doesn't call me sweetie, and she doesn't wear perfume, he said. That makes her almost perfect. Billy pauses in mid-stride to watch the sunlight filter down through the leaves and dapple the rocks in the branch. He's been back in Indiana six months, and still he can't get used to the trees, all these trees, and the low hills clumped together close. Everything is close here, even the sky. Close, just above the tops of the white oaks. Not like Montana, where he's lived for 17 years, barring the occasional trip back for his daughter's wedding and then six years ago, his mother's funeral. Not like Montana at all. He sits down on a fallen tree, green and furry with moss, closes his eyes, and struggles to see Yellow Mountain, Flat Top, Sinipa, Sahi. The peaks range themselves behind his eyelids. He remembers the shock of cold air in his lungs when he'd come out of the cabin on a winter morning. It was always a shock how cold cold could be. Oh, and the stars at night. An ocean of stars splashed across the sky. He wishes himself back there, out there, up there in his tiny cabin at the foot of Yellow Mountain, the clear sky, the cold, quick streams full of water from the glaciers, the wind pushing the aspens into permanent curves. Oh, he wishes. But he's here now, back in southern Indiana, where he spent nearly 30 years looking for mushrooms, because his father would said two nights ago, be nice to have a mess of morels, even though he can hardly keep anything on his stomach. He's thin to translucence, got no hair. Billy knows now to pat the creases in his elbows and behind his knee dry so the skin won't get sores. He knows how to lift his father, how to feed him, how to pause between sips of water sucked through the straw, how to listen for the subtle change in his breathing pattern when the morphine kicks in and he drifts off finally to sleep. And here he is looking for mushrooms. He hadn't done this in so long. Got a plastic Kroger bag crammed in his hip pocket in case he actually does find some. Not that he expects to. He's almost forgotten what a morel looks like. But even as he thinks this, he sees in his mind's eye the creamy head all dimpled and pocked. There was a place up past the little waterfall at the top of the dry branch, a small depression in the earth, like a pocket almost, where his grandmother used to take him. They mostly found chanterelles, chanterelles in a kind of clumpy mushroom she called chicken of the woods, though it didn't really taste like chicken. Once, though, in a wet spring, they'd hunted for hours, climbed up and down the spine of the woods till their calves ached, and their ankles were red with briar snags. And then all of a sudden, there were the morels. Everywhere you looked, their odd mottled heads thrusting up from the ground. That was the day he'd found an arrowhead in the dry branch, reaching down to pick up a crinoid. There it was, almost perfect, with just a tiny chip broken off the shaft, gray, small, its flaked edges still sharp. A rivulet of sweat runs down the back of his neck. He gets up, conscious suddenly of heat and too many clothes on. His feet are hot. His shirt is stuck to his back. 
Still, it feels good to sweat and be outside, not sealed in his father's house with a temperature of constant 78 degrees. Daddy doesn't complain. Billy has watched now for months as the tumors on his vertebra slowly paralyze him. Three weeks ago, Billy found his cache of morphine in the bureau drawer. Daddy, he'd said, you got some plan you haven't told me about? Silence grew between them. Daddy? Yes, I did have a plan. When I could still get out of bed by myself, I figured when it got real grim, I'd just take all that and go to sleep finally and not wake up. His fingers pleated the edge of the sheet. But that was in February. And that's almost May. And, said Billy gently. His father sighed. And I find, don't laugh now, I find I want to see your mother's peonies bloom. It sounds crazy, but I want them to bloom. I want you to walk in through that door with a whole armful of them. I want to put my face in them and feel their petals and smell their fragrance. I'm waiting on the peonies, Billy. Billy sat down on the floor beside the bed. Slowly, slowly, his father's hand crawled over and touched his hair and his cheek. Open the window, son. Let the spring in. After the peonies bloom, maybe we'll make a new plan. Billy hikes up the branch till he gets to the old flat stone ledge where, 80 years ago, his grandfather and Reuben French hacked out blocks for the summer kitchen and hauled them down on a sledge behind the mule. A small stream of water, no bigger around than his wrist, pours over the lip of the ledge into the pool. There's not but two feet of water in there. The water glitters in the sunlight. The rocks gleam. Billy smells the water, the leaf mold, the earthy, busy, complicated smell of the ground. He takes off his boots, and then his socks, and then his shirt. Oh, hell, why not, he thinks, and takes his pants off, too. Not much water in there, but it'll surely be cool. It's when he leans over to put his glasses inside his boot that he sees the first mushroom. It isn't very big, but next to it is another, and another. Astonished, he puts his glasses back on and fumbles out the plastic bag. He can't believe it. Morels are everywhere. There, there. Look at that big one over there. He cups his hand beneath the first one, feeling its rubbery stalk and the slight heft of the head. Something knotted up and fierce loosens in his chest, and he begins to cry. Naked, weeping, he picks them all that he can find. He'll fill the bag before he sits in the tiny pool of clear water. He'll batter and fry them when he gets back to his father's house. He'll cut them into tiny pieces and push each piece gently, gently between his father's thin lips. They'll eat the mushrooms. They'll wait for the peonies to bloom. They'll make a new plan.